And uh, someone from Kamlaki too, that's great. Well, thank you so much to everyone for choosing to be with us tonight for this virtual talk. I know there's lots of options for uh, places you can go to, um, for, to get content online. And I'm really pleased you've chosen to be with us this evening. So thank you for joining us. My name is Dana Thorne and I'm the Curator Supervisor at the Lambton Heritage Museum. And I'll be the moderator for the talk here tonight. I'm gonna to start with just a little bit of background about using Zoom um, before we jump into our talk. So if you haven't had a chance to participate in the Zoom webinar before, there's a few things that you should keep in mind. Um, you can use the chat box on the side to talk with other webinar attendees or with our presenters. Um, just make sure that you've selected all attendees when you put your messages, otherwise just myself and the panelists will see your notes. Um, but certainly please use the chat or the Q&A to submit questions tonight. And um, I will present those to our panelists as we go. So we would um, love to hear what you're thinking and uh, what you would like to know about as well. The um, exhibit that this virtual talk is focused on is going to open August 4th at the Heritage Museum. We're really excited to be reopening the museum after having been closed for the COVID-19 pandemic. We're looking forward to welcoming people back and uh, welcoming them back with such a great exhibition. And the exhibit will run until September 26th. Uh, the exhibit was co-curated by Summer Brissett and Monica Virtue, and they've joined us here tonight to share a little bit about the experience of putting the exhibit together and some of the important conversations um, that this exhibit has sparked. The exhibit is called Nikki Wayman, We Are Going Home, and it examines the relationship between colonialism and the loss of lands by the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point First Nation. It was a response to the 25th anniversary of the Ipperwash crisis of 1995. And the exhibit introduces the concept, the concept of Chi Nakinigewin, did I get that right, Summer? <laughs> or natural law as a driving force for land and water protection. Using interviews, maps, moving images, soundscapes, and wampum, it illustrates the relationship between people, land, and the Anishinaabeg nationhood. The exhibit was first presented at Museum London in late 2020, and it's been brought closer to home for its time here at the Lambton Heritage Museum. So I wanted to welcome our panelists here tonight, Summer and Monica. Um, do we wanna start just by introducing yourselves? Maybe Monica, just tell us a bit about, um, a bit about yourself. Okay, so uh, my name is Monica Virtue and coming to you tonight from Lambton Shores, but I'm originally from Woodstock, Ontario. And uh, I also have my dog, Mary, here with me. So if you hear any strange sounds in the background, that would be Mary. Um, I first met Summer. How did we meet Summer? Jogging, we're both runners. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I originally, as a kid, had a trailer uh, at a trailer park, or my family did, 10 minutes down the road from Camp Pipperwash. And so I grew up in the area, five generations of my family have been tourists here. So uh, my grandpa actually saw the Ipperwash Casino being built. He remembered in 1929, seeing the casino going up. And that's when him and his parents and grandparents started coming to Ipperwash Beach. So I, I've always been in the area and I've always wanted to spend time here. And when I'm not here, I miss it. So, um, Eventually, Summer and I cross paths, and I'll let Summer take it from there. Miigwech, Monica. Abujo Neo Banasi Kandishna Kaz Mang and Odem. Will Kodong Minwa Jodanong and Donjuba Nishnabi Kwe Minwa Bodoatami Kwe Nindao. And I'm so very happy and thankful um, for, for this work that's been done and, and for the opportunity to bring this really important exhibit closer to home. Um, and yeah, so I'm from, I'm from Kettle and Stony Point First Nation, um, born and raised. Uh, I was raised by my grandparents, right? <laughs> Directly across from Lake Huron. And, and that was uh, the view that I saw growing up. Um, over the years, lots of people have asked me if I've ever taken it for granted um, growing up with that beautiful view. And I answer honestly that I have never, never have I ever taken that view for granted. It's so, um, 
I'm beholden to it. And, and so it's been a real labor of love to, to do this work. And, and I met Monica years ago, we were running together. And then through our running, we discovered that we we're both big history nerds. <laughs> and so we, <laughs> we geek out regularly um, to, you know, talking about history, to talking about um, treaties and, and, and all things uh, related to the history of this territory. So um, Monica and I have a few shared interests over the years and um, my own journey uh, as an artist, curator and educator has um, taken me to quite a few places and very, very rarely have I had the opportunity to do work in my home territory, in my home community. So um, I'm really happy about this and, and really happy to, to share it with um, our, my community and the surrounding territory. Miigwech. Well, it's so great to have you both here tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, could you start just by telling us a little bit about how the exhibit came together? Summer, do you want to go first? So back in yeah, I, so I, I was the one that contacted Monica. Um, so back in July 2020, I was approached by Museum London. Um, and I had just finished a contract with Museum London earlier that year. And, and so in July, they were, you know, hoping to do something uh, to support the uh, awareness around the 25th anniversary of Ipperwash. And in the middle of that, I was planning a wedding, um, but I also, you know, in spite of that, I, I felt like a huge sense of responsibility to tell a story. And, and so I, I contacted Monica right away because of her closeness to um, the, the public inquiry and her work with Sam George and, and um, be also being a documentary filmmaker. So I felt that that was a really great tie in to, you know, Museum London being an arts museum, um, but this also being a very educational um, project and exhibit to work on. And so I contacted Monica and, and we, you know, at that time had a very short time to put together an exhibit. And, and I feel like the journey since then, you know, um, back in, I think, October, September, October, um, we heard from Dana and wanting to bring this exhibit close to home to the Lambton Heritage Museum. And so um, that's, you know, it came together really quickly, but it's been a real journey throughout and I'll let Monica speak to that. This is something that I'm wondering if Dana expected when she contacted us. <laughs> Because uh, she had seen the exhibition at Museum London. And we only had, I think, two months, two and a half months to put together that exhibition. And so Summer was planning a wedding. Like her wedding was the day of the original opening. Um, I was working 40 hours a week. So I was going home at night and doing the museum exhibition, like for Museum London, until all hours. Um, and I felt like I shaved a couple of years off my life because the time frame was so short. So I think when Dana approached us, we were both kind of like, hmm. <laughs> uh, it was like we saw it as an opportunity to fix all the mistakes that we felt we had made on the Museum London exhibition. Um, I, I don't know if Dana thought we were just going to bring it exactly as it was. Probably. <laughs> and um, but I, I think we were both kind of excited about the idea of like making it better because it, because the time frame was so short and also the tone was different for Museum London um, because it was centered around the 25th anniversary, the actual 25th anniversary, whereas this time the anniversary had passed and because it was going to be closer to Kellen Stony Point and closer to the community, we didn't want it to be so serious, I think, because it, it's such a traumatic subject matter. Um, the the Ipperwash crisis itself, as it's come to be known, 
Um, so I think we saw it as an opportunity of like, how can we make this something that the First Nation community can fall in love with? And um, I don't know, Summer, do you, does that kind of sum and, and up? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, that was, you know, we were really thankful because I feel with like the shortened timeline at Museum London, um, it was the, the priority was getting the information out there and telling a story that is respectful and authentic um, and, and truthful. And, and also, and, and I say this, you know, in that we wanted to do it responsibly. And, and so we focused on the theme around consent and consent was a huge, uh, like, I guess, theme in, in that original exhibit and also in this one. Um, and again, I, I think Monica mentioned, you know, the events of September 1995 as being really traumatic and triggering. Um, and, and myself, uh, you know, being a, a community member, hearing some of the archival um, documentation and, and audio at times, the surveillance images um, was actually really like triggering for me um, to re recognize community members um, who were no longer here, who had since passed on since 1995, and to see them as young people, you know, a lot of people who, you know, have, have grown older since then, um, to see all of the changes that have come, but all of the things that have also stayed the same. And so it was, you know, a more somber tone, I feel, with, with that first incarnation of, of this exhibit. And one of the things that was super important to me, you know, when Monica and I had our initial discussions about putting the exhibit together was, okay, we want to be responsible, we want to be respectful. Um, how are we going to do this? And for me, my, I guess, what I really wanted to um, have stand out for, as part of the exhibit was the land itself. And, and so understanding, um, you know, why, and, and I guess we'll talk more about this when we discuss Chinook um, but why the land, you know, is, is featured so prominently throughout this iteration through Nagiwayman. Nagi um, and, and so what I really love about this exhibit at um, Lambton Heritage Museum now is that we were able to bring in elements from the land and, and feature those, you know, um, feature the you know, white birch and cedar and, and you know, the beach itself, it's, it's all very much there. And I feel like when we're talking about Indigenous people, when we're talking about Anishinaabe people, we can't do that without a conversation about the land. And so I was really and really thankful that we were able to do that at the Heritage Museum. So it's, it's been, I guess it's been an evolution and a transformation from the original exhibit. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like the tone, the tone speaks more to that, um, the interconnectedness of people in place. So um, yeah, I, I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I would say I wasn't ex expecting changes to the exhibition. We brought it from Museum London, but it's been amazing to see to see those uh, developments and see how it's presented now. So it's been um, a oh, pleasure to, the, to watch that come together. One of the big things that made it different this time was the artwork. So at Museum London, um, they had already selected a painting by Robert Hull and then had approached Summer. And it was already part of their collection. So, uh, so I understand like the, how, how the idea came about at Museum London, but Robert Hull isn't a community member. So um, when, and also his painting couldn't travel. So we were kind of left with this um, kind of blank canvas of what do we want to do? Should we ask someone else to contribute artwork and who should that person be? And then um, as we were kind of in the process of brainstorming, I had seen someone share in their Facebook feed. Um, it was a map of Kettle Point and it was done by Bridget George. 
and I, I'm a big mapping geek, like that's my thing is mapping. So when I saw this map go through my feed of Kettle Point, which I'm like so, um, like Kettle and Stony Point and mapping Kettle and Stony Point is what I've focused on for years. Um, and, and the way it was done. So Bridget had used her own handwriting and she had put in little place names like counter mapping is the uh, official academic name for this is when you, you take, like mapping is something that the state used or the crown or Canada used to um, create power over the territory and create, create power throughout the country. And when you counter map, you can take that and use it as a tool for yourself and kind of flip it on its head. So Bridget had put in all these little locations on her map about where she had met her husband, I think, and where she used to go with her grandma for ice cream, those kinds of things. So as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, there's an idea. And then um, it kind of morphed from that because then we were also thinking of like, we need a motif for the whole thing to tie it all together. So it had kind of grown from, um, I know that we had gone in to look at the gallery while there was another exhibition in there when we were first planning it. And the introduction panel was hanging on this rod. And I looked at the rod and I thought, oh, that would be really cool if we could hang like moss or something on the ends of the rod. And I'm, I'm always thinking like a production designer, like, or a, like how to create props and sets and that kind of thing. And so I was thinking of, it very theatrically, I think. And then um, I think Summer may have said, well, what about cedar? Or one of the two of us said, well, instead of moss, what about cedar? And then it kind of grew from that. Well, why don't we get Bridget to draw us cedar? And we can use that as our motif for the whole thing. So even um, that kind of grew into like she had given us a couple of different options for the cedar. And then it was this big serious discussion around, well, which option do we pick? Because each one had its own feel to it. Um, we put a lot of thought into like every little detail of this. So the one that we went with had little dots at the ends of the cedar. Like to me, it felt like polka dots, but I know it, that's, it's like pointillism. Um, some of your mom yeah. uses this in her artwork. <laughs> So, um, but it had a very playful feel to it with the little dots, like joyful. And I really liked that mm -hmm. because it took the tone from like Robert Hill's painting was very abstract and serious feeling. And Bridget's artwork is very, uh, very joyful and kind of cute. Yeah, like there's the little dots. Yeah, here it is. So we ended up repeating that image over and over throughout the entire gallery and the marketing and everything. So yeah, we were very excited to have Bridget <laughs> join us. <laughs> yeah, it, and, and I think, you know, part of using um, the motif of the cedar and the selection of, of Bridget um, is also symbolic of, you know, we're, we're representing many generations of community members through this exhibit and you know Bridget is a young artist um, an up and coming illustrator and graphic designer and so it was just a nice way to bring the project back around and, and shift the tone you know you know to the I guess to the hopefulness you know for the future um, that our youth bring to the community and, and, and what people are doing um, today and and I think you know Part of that also, we, we changed the name. So the name is Nagi Wayman, And we had some discussion with language keepers um, about the word Nagi um, I was talking with my grandfather, Fred Brissett, and then, you know, Monica was having discussions with Doug George, who is also a language speaker. And, and so we, we wanted to be authentic to the dialect of Kettle and Stony Point. And so Nagiwemen, you know, has a lot of meaning, you know, it means, you know, we're going home. Um, and, and so in a sense, the exhibit is coming home. 
And then we also are returning to the land and our original teachings and, 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 and reconnecting through this exhibit. And then around the same time, the houses came into Stony Point as well. So, um, so that was a really neat kind of something we didn't know when we started doing this, that, that the housing was going to come in. I think that was February. So I think we had already chosen the name by then. Yeah. And then the houses arrived. So that was really, it's the word for that, synchronicity. Uh, when two events happen that aren't connected, but they seem connected. So those would be cool as well. Um, one of the other great elements that Bridget George brought to the exhibit was the, the turtle map, which was an entirely new, um, new element that we introduced. Can you talk a little bit about um, the significance of the turtle map and how that came together? So this is, um, I, I absolutely love this. And again, you know, Monica, Monica's passion is mapping and counter mapping. And so one of the things and elements that we, we introduce in the exhibit um, is the topic of Chinook Nguyen, which is in like natural law. Um, we, we use wampum belts also to illustrate um, pre-contact agreements. And um, I think having, having those historical elements and cultural, cultural elements also being reflected with this turtle map, which then is also a map of our origin story as Anishinaabeg. And, and so the turtle map itself illustrates our origins, um, how we understand them um, as beginning on the East Coast and our great migration to the Great Lakes. And I think, you know, a part of this was, was orienting and disrupting again colonial narratives through counter mapping. And so the turtle is oriented to the east. And so oftentimes, you know, when we look at maps and, and you know, there's an illustration of Turtle Island, the head will be at the like in the north, facing in the northern direction. And, and so this map is kind of like a way that we are unsettling, um, you know viewers perspectives and 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 redirecting it back to an indig indigenous ways of seeing and understanding the world that was something we had discussed for museum london i know um like there's always this debate back and forth where like summer will have an idea and then i always think about what the audience is so i I'm always thinking, well, 95% of our audience is going to be like white settlers who this stuff is brand new to me. And are we going to lose them if we go too far? And so that was one of the things I think there's only been two, three things now where I've been like, oh, no, summer, like we're going to lose them if we do that. And it was she wanted to turn all the maps to the east. So there's five other maps explaining how the land at Stony Point was stolen. And um, I really wanted to focus on white man's law and how that was used as a tool to steal the land. And I wanted like the white audience to understand how their own laws had been used to steal the land. So I had worked quite a bit um, with David Plain from the Amtrong First Nation on these maps for Museum London and making sure that we were legally accurate, but that we were telling it, and we only had like 50 words or 150 words or something like that, that we could tell this in, so it was very short. So we had to use a lot of data visualization, which is using visuals to try and tell the story instead of words. Um, so that's like using color to represent things or that kind of thing. So, um, we had, I designed all five maps. And then I think at that point, Summer said, well, I want to turn them all to the east. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what? like, I love the idea um, because I was already familiar with it from treaty workshops that I used to do with David Payne, where we would go into schools when the curriculum back in 2017 was going into the schools for the first time, the indigenous curriculum. Teachers had no idea how to teach it. So school board 
school boards were hiring David and I to go in and present sometimes up to three days long workshops. So I was already familiar with seeing maps oriented to the east. Um, but, but combining that with trying to explain white man's law at the same time, I was kind of fearful that we would lose the audience by doing that. So it was great that we got to add this additional six map for this exhibition because now we got to do it to the east and in a way like with a topic that really warranted it being the migration story. So I can just imagine a lot of visitors are gonna stand there like <laughs> looking at it, trying to figure out at first what they're looking at. Um, I have seen the map, Dina, I didn't tell you, I don't think that I was peeking through the windows at the museum this afternoon. <laughs> and I saw the, the map up against the wall. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's huge. Yeah, and it's huge. It looks it great, great, but it was upside down. So it was additionally it kind of hard to see, but. Yeah, it, I'm excited to see it up on the wall because it's so big. Yeah, it's going to look great. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about what it means to, to mark the 25th anniversary of the upper wash crisis last year? Hmm. Um, I think, you know, again, it's, you know, we're, we're past the, the 25th anniversary, but last year, it was, you know, the, I think the tone, the tone is really, I think, a solemn, you know, recognition and, and acknowledgement, particularly because, you know, at that time we were still in the middle of the, I mean, still in the pandemic. Um, and because our communities, you know, and families haven't really been able to gather with each other, to grieve communally, to acknowledge each other and, and rekindle, you know, those, those strong family relationships, those kinship networks. Um, and so it, it's been, you know, it, I guess it felt a little isolating um, for myself, um, not, being, not being at home during that time. And, and you know, I've, I've been very vigil <laughs> vigilant um about you know like COVID protocols and, and particularly because you know I have grandparents who I'm very close to um and you know trying to keep people safe keep myself safe and, and so it was really hard like I'll, I'll speak for myself um it was really hard to have that anniversary pass and not be be able to be together as a community as we excuse me, as we normally would. And, and I think now with recent events, you know, and the uncovering of, you know, the mass graves of children in residential schools, we are faced with irrefutable truths. And, and for Indigenous people, it's, you know, these are things that we have always known, we've always understood. We know the history of the land. We know um, what our connection is to our home territories. As with residential schools, we know this history and we've been telling these stories over and over again. And, and I think now with you know, the recent events and news that have come to light, we're, we're back in focus. We're back, um, you know, there's a lot of attention focused on indigenous people and communities right now. And people are saying, well, what can I do? And I think foremost, it's to be educated and self-educate, really take that opportunity to self-educate about truth and reconciliation, about residential schools. Um, and, and, you know, I hope that you visit this, this exhibit and, and learn something about, about the true history of this, of this territory that oftentimes, you know, hasn't been told in schools, it hasn't been shared but it's been shared amongst indigenous people um, forever. You know, these are the things that I grew up understanding and knowing. So I think, you know, that marking the 25th anniversary and, and also understanding the healing work that indigenous people and communities need to do without demanding the emotional and mental labor of indigenous people to educate about these things, especially right now at this time, because there are you know so many resources out there to access, um, to self-educate 
and, and you know, lot, lots of allies out there who are doing the work. Um, and, and so I would really encourage you at this time to take a look at those recommendations um, to self-educate, to visit this exhibit, um, and to acknowledge um, really uncomfortable conversations about power, privilege, and racism, and genocide in Canada, because they're all related. They're all related to land loss. For me, it was um, the 25th anniversary. I, I knew I would be busy leading up to it, because usually anytime time Wash shows up in the news, um, like if something happens in the area or within the community, then journalists always contact me usually off the record, or I'll just say, can we keep this off the record? And so that um, I always want coverage to be accurate because there's always so much inaccurate um, media coverage when it comes to the story. Um, I didn't anticipate the volume of attention the 25th anniversary would bring. Um, for me, I'm very used to talking about it because I've, been working on a documentary about the upper wash places for 18 years now. So I started back in November 2002 when I was 26 years old and I'm now 44. So it's become kind of like a life's work without me intending it to ever become that. Um, but I've become, and I, I didn't realize until we started working on the Museum London exhibition, um, I've become very, like, I'm very much used to looking at things like inquiry exhibits that contain very traumatic subject matter. So Summer was talking about earlier, um, looking at surveillance photos and those didn't make it into the exhibition. Like we kind of, we pulled back from what we could have done because we could have made it very, um, it's the word is going to be trauma porn. Yeah. When um, settlers, they only like to see the, the trauma being told and they don't want to hear other parts of the story. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that precisely in the best way, but um, I, it, because I'm sitting on so much, like inquiry exhibits, audio exhibits, like I have three days of audio that came out of the OPP command post that no one, even in the Kettle and Stony Point community, I'm saying nobody's heard it. Very, very few people have heard it. Um, probably only the people that sat in the Ipawash inquiry testimony uh, and the lawyers, um, Dudley's family members, would be familiar with it, but even the people who were with Dudley that night probably haven't even heard these audio tapes. So I have to kind of pick and choose or be very careful about um, what I share and how I talk about it because it's not my own story. And that kind of um, gets into the, the discussion of like allyship. And what does that mean? And how how do you be a good ally? Um, but yeah, and it, I did know. have um, a, a question from one of our attendees who was wondering if we could show a few of the maps um, that are going to be on display in the exhibit. Yeah, with I okay with, with Carissa asked that, and yeah, I thought maybe like we could describe what people will see when they walk in the gallery as well. Would that be helpful? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull up the maps here. So um, when you walk in the gallery, what we're hoping people see first is um, the wampum belts. There's four wampum belts. And we've picked those very carefully because we want those to tie into the maps. So we put a lot of thought into this. Um, there was like, it's kind of a process where Summer will come up with the idea. And then I just see it as my role to make her idea happen. <laughs> so, 
So Summer, do you want to explain like how you, how you approach like what you wanted to see in this? Sure. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm glad Monica is there to temper all of these, like, you know, sometimes I can, you know, I'll, I'll have this idea and, and it can be kind of radical. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, Monica and I have like this great way of riffing back and forth off of each other. Um, and so I, I wanted the, the wampum belts, um, if you've ever seen them, to be front and center. Because, you know, and Monica is background as a, as a treaty researcher, um, is a great juxtaposition of having the wampum belt and, and the, um, I guess the treaty information, because the assumption, the, the common assumption is that indigenous people, um, you know, prior to contact, prior to confederation, um, you know, didn't have, you know, the, the sophistication to create these, um, to create these, you know, land protocol agreements amongst each other. And yet, you know, we have and we do, and, and we have wampum belts as testimony um, to those really intricate relationships that we have with each other as nations, you know, not just as Anishinaabeg, but as Haudenosaunee and, and the Iroquois nations, those longstanding uh, relationships that existed prior to contact, prior to confederation. Um, and, and wampum was used um, in, in our own treaty making process. And, and so having those wampum belts front and center um, also speaks to how important these, these living documents are to us. So they're not just a paper document that's stored and it's archived somewhere. That, that handling these, you know, th they're very tactile and, and they're, they tell a story. And those people who carry the knowledge of wampum belts and, and the history and the agreements that are embedded within those belts, and, and, and we say belts, but they're not actually like belts. Um, they're, they're in the shape of a belt. Um, but that, you know, these are, are items that are used to, you know, retell our oral history. And, and that oral history goes back generations, generations, all the way back to our migration story, which we have illustrated on the turtle map. And, and so having those wampum front and center, I think also, again, you know, when we're talking about, you know, how the map and the turtle map itself reorients the viewer to an indigenous way of seeing and understanding the world, having those wampum front and center also lets you know that you are walking into an indigenous space that indigenous perspectives and, and ways of being are upheld here. And, and so I, you know, it was really important for me to have the wampum belt there to, um, to juxtapose with, you know, the, the treaty information um, with the maps, because I feel like these are, you know, the most powerful illustrations that we have of our agreements amongst with each other as nations, as sovereign nations. And, and I think that they, you know, I couldn't have done the exhibit without them. And so we're really thankful to have the, the wampum there that we do. And they're displayed a little different this time. Um, it's, uh, we haven't seen the final product. I've seen it half. Um, half finished summer. I didn't give you an update on this. I saw the wampum rack. <laughs> it's pretty big. Um, but it, so in, at Museum London, the, the belts were under glass and we want to do it a bit different this time because they're living, breathing agreements that they should be not under glass. They should be out in the open. And uh, so we were thinking like, how can we display this in a way that's, um, I was again thinking theatrically and I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I know what the throne looks like. So <laughs> I thought, what if we build something to kind of give that vibe, give off that vibe? So it's kind of half 
finished right now. It'll be finished by August 4th <laughs> on opening day. Um, but we have someone helping us create that so that those four wampum belts are displayed in a way that um, if you've ever held a wampum belt, they're very heavy and they feel because they're constructed of beads, right? And originally not the glass beads, they're originally shells. And so by the time you have like the one belt, the 24 nation belt is almost seven feet long. So you can imagine how heavy that would be. And it feels very important when you're holding them. Um, so it's too bad with COVID that we're not able to let people actually touch them, um, but they will be there. And they, it, because they tell a story within the belt, then they tie into the maps that you're gonna see when you walk in. And um, I guess if you're going, it's best to go in and go clockwise. This time at Museum London, it was counterclockwise, but this time it's clockwise. And you're gonna see six maps along the wall. So one is um, Bridget's new map of the migration story. And then five other maps that were at Museum London, but we've improved them. So um, before they had original place names on them in the Anishinaabemowin language. Um, so that's part of counter mapping, like taking back that power by putting the original names of those locations back on the map. But this time it's in Bridget's handwriting. So it ties it into the turtle map. And then, um, so did we wanna show some of the maps right now? Dana, do you actually have any that are handy? Yeah, I have the uh, turtle map here. Summer, do you want to explain what people are seeing? Sorry, it's kind of zoomed in, but I, I, it's such a large file that it's having a hard time zooming out. Uh, that was what it was like to actually create these maps as well. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> it's um, such a big file, yeah. Bridget and I were going back and forth on it. So, because, I wanted her map to have the same feel to it as the other five maps um, in terms of like how it was laid out, how it was designed on the page. So um, Bridget and I were sharing files back and forth. And because it was so large, it, it would take a long time. Um, so you can see some of these names that are on it are repeated on some of the other maps because we start to zoom in on the other maps. And like we start very wide with the other maps um, looking at, like this is Turtle Island, which is North America, but we've kind of zoomed in on the Great Lakes with her map. Um, and then the next map is we're looking at all of North America and then over the course of the five maps, we're zooming in on Stony Point to explain um, in particular how Stony Point was stolen. And Stony Point has a few different names as well. Um, it's also known as um, the Osabo Reserve, the Stony Point Reserve, Stony with a Y, Stony with an EY. Um, and then the original place name, and Summer, you'd be way better at describing that than I would. So, yeah, it, it, I guess, you know, what we're talking about now is is also another, I guess, another theme, theme of the exhibit, which is language. And and so the Anishinaabemo in language, like you'll see there's a, 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 the introduction that's also translated into Anishinaabemowin. And, and I feel like if you are a language speaker, um, I grew up with my grandfather who is a fluent language speaker in Kenlin Stony Point. And to just give you a little bit of context about why this is important. I'm going to say that I am the last generation 
in my family to grow up hearing Anishinaabemowin spoken as a first language in our home. And that's the, that's the evidence, you know, some of the evidence of the devastation of residential schools. And so we have a community in Kettle Point, I think the on-reserve population is about a thousand or, or 1200 on reserve. And about 15, 15 years ago now, we did a language survey. And then there were approximately 11 fluent first, first language speakers. So the first language speakers were, you know, elderly. At that time, they were seniors. They were all above the age of 65. Um, and my grandfather was one of those language speakers. And, you know, over time, we've lost so many of those fluent language speakers because of their, because of their age. And, and so this is just how precious our language is to us. And so to be able to have the language featured with all of the original place names for um, landmarks for the communities themselves it it was so important and it's also a statement you know about um, I guess the status of indigenous languages of the Anishinaabe one language um, and that's the reason why it's featured throughout um, again it's I feel like there, there are so many tiny little you know elements that we could pick and choose from um, and, and for me, it was always making sure that language was foremost as well as the land. Um, and, and Monica mentioned earlier, uh, moving away from trauma porn, because we didn't want to sensationalize, um, we didn't want to sensationalize the events, you know, that led to the death of Dudley George, because it's not, again, that's not our story to tell. And you know, out of respect for the family of Dudley George, we wanted to be able to tell this story um, so that people could get an understanding of the why. Why did this happen? Why did Anishinaabe, you know, stand up in 1995 and in all of the years before 1995 and after 1995, why did Anishinaabe stand up for land and water rights? And so that, that was a way that we were able to tell the story and answer those questions of why, why. And, and it's done through the maps, it's done through Chinatha game and it's done through the language. Um, and, and that being the driving force um, behind land and water protection movements today. Even little <laughs> details. Um, I was just gonna talk about like the, the little parts of the language that we like we wanted to make sure that we nailed it so that when it was up on the map we didn't nobody came along and was like they just made a huge mistake um and so one of them was um ajude na versus ajude nong and the difference between the two and it, like which summer can you explain the difference between how those two words are written and said so they're, they're okay. <laughs> Nishnabemoin is not a language that is ver, I mean, it's not noun based. It's not, it's, it's so vastly different from the English language, which is based on nouns and pronouns. Nishnabemoin is based on verbs and adjectives. And so a word, a word in the language isn't actually a noun but it's a phrase, it's, it's a word within a word or a story within a story. My cats are going crazy back there. <laughs> um, and so I, I feel like understanding what is meant by like, we add words like the, a sound like ng ng or ong, which becomes like a locative. And so it, it places you, the person in direct relationship, like spatially, to that land. And so Ajo Denong with the NG becomes like you are locating yourself in relationship to that specific place. Um, so there's like a, a whole discussion of, of language and linguistics that we could have and, and why certain words are written the way that they are. 
Can you talk a little bit about our name, the Bear Contest, and some of the um, the resurgence of, of people exploring this language that the name, the Bear Contest, provoked? So the Bear Contest um, originated with uh, I was going into the bush, and it was actually to collect some dead birch that I was trying to create something. So when I had um, things like this happen that I wouldn't have a boring background. So I went in to the bush near my house and I posted on Facebook and I said, I'm going in, if I don't come out in an hour, send a search party. And Red George, who I'm friends with on Facebook, he wrote underneath, watch out for them. You have the little bear emoji, <laughs> watch out for the bear. And I'd forgotten all about the bear. And so, um, where had I had gone into in the bush kind of um, is separated by a road and then it's Stony Point right next door, um, which is where the bear had, had really been reported being seen. So I was actually in the bush when I saw Red's comment on my phone and oh no. <laughs> and then Red said, well, the bear needs a name. And I said, oh, we should have a contest for the name. And then I just had this little light bulb and I thought we should ask the Lampton Heritage Museum if we can have a contest. So I know, um, I shouldn't say I know that Summer was a little hesitant. I could tell by her first message that she was a little hesitant because I, and I can see why, because um, I could imagine all these people like trying to find the bear or something, trying to hunt down the bear. And we wanted to make sure it was like very respectful to the bear and that there was some kind of teaching attached or, um, because when we were talking about the migration story map with Bridget, Summer had told this story that she had learned from a knowledge keeper about the, a bear. It, so uh, bears had already come up in the discussion and we had already thought about incorporating bears into the exhibition, but we ended up thinking, no, it's too complicated. So when Dana was supportive of the name, the bear contest, we were pretty excited because <laughs> it already tied into what we were thinking anyways. Um, so Red donated the painting and then we donated, um, we're gonna have to meet with the winner, um, Chris Harrington, who came up with this three page, fully written like paragraphs, but <laughs> footnotes as a researcher myself I was like really impressed with the footnotes but there was so many like we had over 350 entries yep. and we put a lot of thought into picking our top 10 even yeah we had originally only going to have the one winner but there were so many great entries that we ended up with the top 10 so the the one winner and then nine runners up because there were just so many great suggestions and a lot of them were in Anishinaabe Moen. Which was unexpected as well. Like yeah. I was thinking only people from Pedal and Stony Point would enter using the language, but it ended yeah. up, it was almost all settlers, I think. Yeah, there were, I mean, the majority of the, the, the entries were in the language, you know, which, which showed like a real, interest a sincere interest to you know use resource online resources self-educate um using the ojibwe language uh dictionary that comes out of the university of minnesota um it's it's a great resource um and and so the the only you know i was i feel like you know monica and i are, are like balancing each other out like all the time you know like she she tempers my you know wild and crazy ideas and then at the same time you know with going forward with the name the bear contest you know um I'm, i i was the word of you know of caution like you know like we have to really be respectful of understanding you know when, when we're using the language again because it's it's so nuanced and it's it's not like the english language and, and so this is something that I've come to appreciate is, you know, with my, with my own very limited understanding of Anishinaabemowin, and if you are a, um, 
if you are a bilingual person or you speak multiple languages, you know that when you speak a different language, you understand the world differently. And I call it putting on my Anishinaabe glasses. And so when I use Anishinaabe Moen and I hear Anishinaabe Moen, I see the world through that lens. And, and one of the things I, I talk about, you know, in, in illustrating what that might seem like if you're not a multilingual person is if you've seen the movie, The Matrix, the, the first one, and they're watching code going down the screen and Neo is like there with, with the one guy and, and, and he's saying, oh, that, that's the lady in the red dress. I, I put her there. Did, did you like that lady in the red dress? And it's all like binary code. Again, to me, when I saw that, I was like, that's what it is when you speak a different language, when you speak Anishinaabemowin, it might not make sense to other people, but you see the world differently. You, you, I think of it as like a window into, you know, the, the, the minds of my ancestors. And, and so I was that cautionary person, you know, when we're talking about, you know, all of the entries that came in in the language, which were, which were fantastic and, and, and super thoughtful. Um, but also to be mindful of, you know, appropriating something that you might not have a complete or full understanding of. So there's a lot of cultural significance that we place on naming. And, and so I, I, I just, you know, we were picking all these wonderful names and, and they're so cool. Um, but we went with, uh, we went with Benjamin Mwinzo. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it, it just demonstrated a lot of thoughtfulness and research. Um, we, you know, we had so many favorites to choose from <laughs> and we, we settled on uh, Benjamin Mwinzo. Yeah, so as a two-part name, um, the first part, Benjamin, comes from a uh, man named Benjamin Gott, who had settled uh, near Arcona in the 1870s, and he was active with the Ontario Fruit Growers Association, and also a very vocal proponent for um, supporting the local environment. And then the the last name, Mowinzo, um, in Anishinaabe Moen, is means he or she who picks berries. So this name, um, both both parts of the name were supportive of um, local berries as being a, a key part of the bear's diet. So it connected back to what the bear eats and um, it was a good, I thought it was and a good balance. Even how detail oriented we were, like at the very end, I think Summer had this moment of panic where, because it, it's true, like in the local dialect, Moenza may not mean mm -hmm. what, we think it means it could be something completely different. So um, we wanted to check with a fluent speaker, and but we were running out of time and people were calling the museum, wanting to know. And calling the museum for, for the announcement for the contest so, winner. Yeah, so I was thinking, well, we didn't specify in the rules that it had to be the local dialect. And when I typed it in, like it came right up in the, the dictionary so I could see that's where Chris got it from. So I thought if, if we say that broadly, this is what it means and that we, um, it may be different in the local dialect, then we've got our bases covered mm -hmm. and Summer's grandpa will come up for us later. And <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say my grandfather is very, very particular again about the language. Um, just, just for example, um, one of the local First Nations my grandfather always, you know, if it's not me, he's correcting somebody else to make sure that those little sounds are all in there. So when we say that those, those words are in there because you could change the sound and it will change the whole meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, again, in, in, in choosing something, we, we, we have to be, you know, super cautious that, that, you know, the language is, we're, we're talking about the same thing. And, and you might have noticed that Monica or, or Dana mentioned that he or she is picking berries. We don't have gendered pronouns in the language. Everything is kind of like on a spectrum of being alive, if you can imagine like animate and inanimate. And even when it comes to inanimate, it's not totally like inanimate. So everything is, it falls on that spectrum which gives it movement and life. So when you're talking about things, it's, it's not 
um, you know, using, you know, conventions of the English language, like, like pronouns and, and things like that. And I did share the link to the um, Ojibwe People's Dictionary in the chat, if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, we also got a comment here to the panelists from Bob Sutton that he, uh, he said I could share with everyone. Um, he said, in my own experiences during the Ipperwash crisis, I found Indigenous people to be so much more open and solutions oriented than most non-Indigenous persons. Even Dudley George's nephew showed an openness to resolution that stays with me to this day. Um, and Summer, I've never forgotten the remarkable poetic creativity you shared with me at North Lampton Secondary School. Uh, we had so much to learn from you. Thank you, Miigwech. It's, it's so nice. I, I Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and also, you know, I, I've, I've had a few of my former teachers um, from NLSS and, and formerly known as Woodside, um, my, my grade five teacher. Um, and I'm going to say this because it's force of habit, but Ms. Tremaine and Mr. Dume and Mr. Sutton, um, it's so, it was so nice to hear from you. And, and I'm so glad that, that you're attending this evening. So you've, we both talked a little bit about um, allyship. Are there any ways that museums can be better allies to indigenous communities and decolonize their practices? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I, I guess my thinking when it comes to anything right now, especially with museums or even if it's like the school or, or um, any kind of program or projects out there that people want to do um, with regard to Indigenous people. And a phrase from the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission uh, that I always bring, you know, I always think about Murray Sinclair, Justice Murray Sinclair said, and, and, you know, very, like very much emphasized, you know, there should be nothing about us without us. And that means, you know, for museums, um, with this project, you know, ensuring that it, it is Indigenous led, um, that there is, you know, ongoing and meaningful consultation with Indigenous communities and elders and knowledge keepers, um, which makes timelines a bit tricky. Because, you know, in working in colonial settings and Western settings, um, timelines and deadlines are, you know, they tend to be very static. Um, and Indigenous communities, um, our relationships govern everything that trusting relationship is the foundation for all of the things that we do, which places relationship and consultation and consensus and consent, you know, amongst our top priorities. And, and so I think, you know, for any, you know, if it's museums or any institution going forward, um, you know, the desire is, you know, to move in the direction of reconciliation but that can't happen without relationship building and authentic, um, I guess, authentic engagement with Indigenous communities and, and knowledge keepers. I think there needs to be a lot of flexibility shown. Um, that's something, it's, it's been a pattern um, that I've seen, like I've run into it over and over because every every time I work on something like this it builds on the last version of what I did um so it, I ran into it particularly when I was at OCAD University doing my master's as well and it was just this very and I mean they've changed a lot since I was there I was the very first non-indigenous student to do an indigenous theme master's and so I was kind of pushing the boundaries there and they were pushing back quite a bit and um, in all these different ways but a lot of it was deadlines um, because if you're dealing with consent like it, settlers do things in a certain way and we move at a certain pace and indigenous people move at their pace which is different and it's okay it's just the way things are done um, so you have to know going into it that you have to move at a different pace. You can't go at the same pace as normal. And then when you add in consent on top of that, now you're not just doubling your timelines, you're tripling your timelines. 
Um, for instance, another thing that you see after the maps is when you go into the gallery is five interviews. So I went out and I interviewed five different people in the community. So one was Summer's grandma, um, one was Berger, who there's a very well-known photo from the morning after um, the incident at a provincial park. And it's of a young man, like he's got his fist in the air yelling and that's Berger. So we actually used that photo and I interviewed him about that photo. And Summer's grandma, um, I interviewed her about the photo of her house on the back of a flatbed truck being moved over to Kettle Point. Um, so the last map is about the War Measures Act and how it was used. And then it goes right into this photo and interview with Summer's grandma, who was a first person. She has a first person account of remembering that day that she moved. And so, um, yeah, there's the, that photo of Berger. So we've actually interviewed him about that photo and he talks about how the photo was taken without his consent, without his knowledge. And he's, he's crying in the photo because he was standing next to Dudley at the time that he was shot and he was the one that found Dudley laying in the sand. And so for him to have that photo taken and not known and then um, apparently people in the community used to tease him about it that he was crying in the photo. And so when I interviewed him, he actually wanted us to use the photo this time. And because he said, I'm, I've kind of moved past that and I'm comfortable with the photo now. And you've asked me and I've given you my permission. So now it's okay. So I think that actually meant quite a bit to him that we gave him that power back to say whether whether we had his permission to use the photo. And then the next photo, uh, we wanted, we wanted, Summer wanted to see the, the land brought into it a bit more. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a photo that I had taken hanging at the side of a helicopter um, of Iperwash Provincial Park. And then I interviewed Tina George, who was part of, um, she was one of the land protectors who had gone in with Dudley on September 3rd, 1995. And so she talks about what it was like having helicopters fly over and the surveillance. Um, and then the next photo is with Pierre. Uh, so Dudley's brother. And again, it was a stock photo and it was him standing in front of the Supreme Court when Ken Dean took his case to the Supreme Court and he lost. And so Pierre talks about what it was like standing there, um, like going to the Supreme Court and what it's been like for him since then. And then the last one is a photo that Dudley's sisters chose. And we asked how they wanted him to be seen. And so they chose a photo of him holding his nephew. Mm -hmm. And originally, I was going to interview the sisters and then at the last minute they pulled out because they weren't ready emotionally to talk about it yet. So um, I ended up using an interview with Doug George who we've already mentioned a couple of times tonight because he's helped so much with this exhibition, like so much with the language and like all these little details. And so Doug, um, He's head of health services, but so he talks about healing a lot and about trauma and um, what that what trauma can do to families. And so he made some comments about passing trauma down to your children. So it kind of went well with Dudley holding a child in his arms. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing we have in the gallery that we haven't mentioned is historical recreation. So we're projecting footage onto the wall. And I think this is originally what Museum, wanted, Museum London wanted, but we just, we didn't have time. 
because of consent. Uh, so again, I was trying to think of like, how did I get on the subject? Um, but it was consent. And I've actually gone back and asked for the consent of every single person that you're gonna see in that footage. So this footage is, it's 20 historical recreations that I filmed between 10 and 15 years ago that nobody in the Kylan Stone Point community has seen yet. So it's kind of, we're premiering the Iperwash Park Film Project, which was never finished because we ran out of funding. Uh, we're kind of premiering it in a way at Lampton Heritage Museum. That's great. So I'm down to three people. I need three people's permission and then I've got everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes a long time to do that. And so to answer the question, what can people do to, what can museums do to decolonize? Like the biggest thing is give lots of time mm -hmm. because you're going to need it if you want to build consent in a, in a real authentic way. So as co-curators on this project, um, what did it mean for an Anishinaabe and a white curator to work together, putting together an exhibition? And did you have any points of conflict along the way? I think, yeah, I, I guess when, when I think about putting this work or workshop, um, this exhibit together with Monica, um, we already had an existing uh, friendship and acquaintanceship going in. And I think a shared passion, a shared passion for this work, for the story, for, um, you know, and, and understanding what it, what it means to, to engage meaningfully with, you know, the Indigenous community, even for myself, um, as an Indigenous community member, as an Anishinaabe Kwe, um, it's, it's understanding that we're all at different places in our healing journey. And, and Monica mentioned this just a little while ago. Um, it's, it's understanding that, that, you know, we, we could be anywhere on that spectrum. And, and I think for myself, when I think about, you know, this exhibit, th there was a point for me where I was, I was very triggered. And, and, you know, I, I had to like, I had to take a step back and, and I really had to communicate that to Monica, but it was something that I had to communicate to myself first because I was like what's going on here you know like I I'm a professional I you know I do this da, 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 da. and it was you know being confronted again um and and I'll, and I'll say this because it, it's happened with the the news of residential schools it's being confronted with with these things where you have like a deep knowing and you understand them but when you are presented with you know, like that irrefutable, like physical evidence, you know, auditory evidence is so tangible. You, you have to confront, for me, you know, as an, as an Indigenous woman, what does it mean to be a survivor? What does it mean to be a survivor of genocide? And that's a question that I've asked myself, you know, most recently with all of these events with this deep knowing and understanding that comes from um, what happened in 1995, you know, and understanding that it didn't happen, you know, it, it wasn't an isolated event, that there were historical events, historical ongoing act of resistance leading up to 1995. And, and knowing full well, um, Monica again was talking about, you know, there, there's a media representation of Indigenous people, and then there's our lived experiences, and how very careful we were, and, and Monica has been in, in selecting those images, selecting, you know, um, like the counter mapping, that's a part of this project. And, and I think it, it's understanding that even though um, I'm a, a co-curator of this exhibit, this exhibit is also in a way, it's about me because I'm from these communities, because I'm, I'm attached to the land. My, my relationship with my grandparents, my relationship 
with with all of my my relatives is makes this also a story about me because I can't tell it without putting myself inside of it. And so for me, the tension wasn't with Monica. The tension was navigating myself as both the subject and the curator of the subject. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for myself as, as an Indigenous co-curator for this project or you know, even, even in, in the future, it, you know, if, if you know, you're planning on working with Indigenous um, community members or artists, storytellers, historians, it's understanding that we are always navigating that tension of being both subject and object within these contexts, within the context of a museum, especially, um, which you know, have historically served to have us as subjects. So I, I think you know, that was my struggle um, as an Indigenous co-curator throughout this project was knowing what the trigger points were and allowing myself and giving space to process those things, but also having, you know, you know, like very necessary, or what's the word? Being very deliberate and, and talking to Monica and saying, hey, this is like heavy for me. I need to take a step back for, you know, let's just, you know, I can't do this right now. So that's, I think what was my, when, when I think about conflict, it's not so much the conflict between white curator and indigenous curator, it's indigenous curator as both subject and object. And then for me, it was getting used to, like we've gotten a lot better because this is our second go around. So the first time was a lot rougher. Um, <laughs> but for me, recognizing when that's happening, because I don't think I, I got it I didn't understand what was happening the first time. Um, I think I thought Summer was just off working on another project and left me all by myself. And then I got kind of offended, not offended, but like thinking, well, I gotta do all this work. And but it, it was because we had such a tight deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the thing with the deadlines is like, when you have a lot of time, it gives people time to process what they're working on and not, compact that emotional experience into this tight timeline as well, just so that you can deliver by the opening date. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, now I think, like I know Summer's tones of her writing now. So when I get a certain kind of sentence, I know I need to kind of back off or maybe choose my words differently or say, maybe we can do it this way instead. And um, yeah, because like I'm always thinking of the audience and that's the filmmaker in me. Like it's always like you're making it for the audience. And how can you create something that's going to have impact with them, but also not be too upsetting for the people that you're working with as well. Um, and that's going to be something I'm going to have to really it's gonna be a challenge, like, cause I still have this film that I wanna finish, um, that I put 18 years worth of work into. Mm -hmm. um, but there is that always ever present indigenous people need to tell their own stories. So how, how do I do that? How do I finish this film? Um, but one way that I looked at it is that because this exhibition is being presented so close to the community. And I knew so many more people were gonna see it than the Museum London exhibition. So I thought I want this exhibition to be representative of what the film is gonna look like. And um, so a lot of that is just like letting Summer take the lead on like be the idea person. And then I'm just in the background um, physically making it happen, like physically designing the maps or physically um, making sure that the planks on the wampum rack are going to be long enough to hold each particular belt. And 
so there's like a lot of tape measurement and like mm -hmm. this is like me working out um the projections so they fit perfectly on the wall and yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of calculator work on my end well you were a wonderful theme or a wonderful team it's an amazing uh, exhibition we can't wait to reopen to the public with this uh, for the summer um, we've only got a few minutes left is there anything that either of you wanted to share um that we didn't have a chance to to talk about Dina, you were worried that we weren't going to fill an hour. I know. <laughs> I know. We, we warned you. We said we could talk forever. <laughs> I, I need to say this because I know my, my former teachers are tuning in. I was an incredibly shy and quiet student. I, I you know, I struggled with finding, you know, my self-confidence and, and, you know, my self-esteem and, it wasn't until, you know, like I was you know, getting ready to graduate, you know, high school. I graduated high school in 1995 and I began, I, I studied film in, in Thunder Bay. Um, but my very first day of college was the day that Dudley died. And I slept in because the thunderstorm knocked out the power in our building. And then my alarm clock, you know, the clock radio went off. And I will never forget the words that the broadcaster said, you know, this was 1995. And he said, violence erupted into tragedy in the community of Kettle and Stony Point. Mm -hmm. And protester Dudley George was shot and killed. I was so far away from home. I was so disconnected from my community at that time. I was the only indigenous student in film. I was one of two young women who were studying film at that time. And, you know, that separation, that, that feeling of, of disconnect from the place that you love the most and the, the place that you needed to be the most mm -hmm. stayed with me like forever, like that's like, it's such a, I feel, I feel it today, you know, even though I'm living in London, you know, that, that, that strong pull, that being from Kettle and Stony Point, that being from the lake has over me. And, and so I, I made it my life's work after that to be connected to home, to also use my voice when I could to tell stories and, and to keep doing that in, in any way that I could. And so, um, you know, I, I wanted to acknowledge my, my former teachers who are part of the discussion this evening, um, you know, for all of their encouragement to me while I was in school in North Lambton and at, at Woodside, you know, um, it's, you know, I've, I've absolutely, you know, enjoyed all of my educational experiences since then, but my first year in college was difficult because that was how I started my first day of school. Thank you. Um, I had a few comments here um, that I'll share from Ralph Teeple. He said, this is such an informative, meaningful, enlightening and helpful presentation. I do hope to see the exhibit. Thank you, Summer Monica and Dana. And uh, from Carrie Meyer, he said, thank you for this discussion and for sharing your stories. I can't wait to see the exhibit. We can't wait to be welcoming visitors back to the museum again. It's been a long time. <laughs> and uh, one more comment from Anne. She said, uh, thank you for the introduction to the exhibit and your stories. It's been a great 90 minutes. Looking forward to visiting it and learning more. Um, we will also be sending out a recording of the talk tonight to everyone who has registered. So if you want to share it with anybody or if there's anything you want to go back and have a second look, um, we'll have that uh, that recording will be sent out by email tomorrow so you can um, you can keep an eye out for that. And uh, great job, ladies from David Plain. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for everyone for being with us tonight. Um, Monica or Summer, was there anything else you wanted to add? We could go on for hours more. Yeah. So <laughs> it's probably safer to just <laughs> stop while we're ahead. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, thanks for being with us and for sharing um, so much about uh, this exhibit and your work. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you both and uh, work with you in presenting this at Lambton Heritage Museum. And um, I can't wait to, to welcome the public and have people see it. So thank you, thank you to Monica and Summer okay. bye for bye. today. And thank you to everyone, uh, everyone who joined us and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.